Hey everyone, welcome back to paper three for the Aiming for Grade 5. So just so you guys are aware, there is an Aiming for Grade 5 paper one and paper two already on the channel. I'll link them in the description in case you want to have a look at those. But this is the paper three. So again, the way you're going to want to do this is you can watch me do it first and listen to my thought processes so you can kind of get that um, exam technique really locked in. And then a day or two later, try the paper for yourself trying out the methods and the approaches that I teach you in this video. But without further ado, let's get straight into it. So for question one, we have the shoe sizes of 12 boys in a class, and it gives us the data already. And if you notice, it's already in order, right? So four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. It says for what I find the median. So uh, kind of working out the averages can be a bit tricky because you need to remember which one's which. So we've got the mean, median, and mode. Median is just the middle value. So what you want to do is put the numbers in order, which we've already done, and then find the middle one. A good way to find the middle one is simply to cross off one from each side. So one and one, two and two. You need to make sure that you're crossing off the same number from each side as well, okay? So if you did three on one side and only two on the other, that's not technically the middle. I'll show you what you have to do um, if that happens to be the case here. So three and three, four, four, five, five, six, and we can't do another six. So what we need to do here is our middle value is both of these. Now I'm going to show you what to do, but it's going to seem a bit weird in this situation because in this situation, what we, it's, they're the same number. But if, for example, it was a six and a seven, you're trying to find the middle of six and seven. And the way you can do that, you can just say it's 6.5, or you can add them together and divide by two. So six add seven is 13, divide by two is of course uh, 6.5. And of course you can use the calculator because it's paper three. Now in this case, both of our numbers are seven. So what's the middle of seven and seven? Well, again, you can add them together. Seven plus seven is 14, divide by two, you still get seven. But either way, whatever one you wanna do it, you get seven. And then for part B, it says work out the range. The range is just, the biggest number minus the smallest number, because you're talking about how many values are in your data, like what is the spread of the data. So you do nine, take away four, and that will give you, of course, five. Perfect. For the shoe sizes of the girls in the class, the median is six and the range is three, and it says compare the distribution. If you notice, it's two marks. And the reason why it's two marks is because whenever it says compare the distribution, so this thing here, you are doing two things, always. You compare the spread of the data. Now, what is the spread? Well, the spread is going to be the range or the interquartile range. And you're comparing the average, okay? The average can be anything. It can be the mean, median, or the mode. So the mean or the median. Now, in this case, what two values do we have? Well, we have the median, which is going to be our average, and we have the range, which is going to be our spread, okay? So whenever you have these questions, the two marks just come from the spread of the data, which is the range or interquartile range, and the average of the data, which is the mean or the median. So in this case, all you need to do is say that the spread of the data is, in this case, well, look, the range here is three for the girls, five for the boys. So the boys' data, or the boys shoe sizes, if you'd like to write it, sizes are more spread out or have a greater spread. And you can write if you want the um, because. So you don't have to usually write the because, but I'm going to write the because for your sake, because the range for boys is bigger. Range for boys is bigger. And then part two, again, we're ca uh, comparing the average. And the average, well, we have seven for boys and six for girls. So the average shoe size for boys is bigger. If you want, you could write average, median in brackets, shoe size is bigger for boys. That's it for two marks. Now, in my opinion, the, the actual maths here isn't too tricky because you're just saying which number's bigger. But the structure is where people lose marks. You have to compare the spread and the average. You have to. You can't talk all about the range. You can't talk all about the median. You can't talk all about something else. You have to talk about the range and the median or the mean and the range as well. 
okay? Question two is a little bit of geometry, which I know uh, kind of sucks for some people, but it says it's a quadrilateral, as we can see, four sides. Work out the size of angle X. So whenever you have a geometry problem, think about all your geometry facts. Now there is a lot that you know, so now we're just gonna talk about quadrilaterals. Now, because this is a generic quadrilateral, it's not a parallelogram, it's not a trapezium or anything like that, there's nothing special about the angles or sides, okay? Instead, we're using the general rule for all quadrilaterals, which is that the angles have to add up to 360. That is true for all quadrilaterals, okay? Again, that's because we're not going to use anything about parallelograms or rectangles or anything because that doesn't exist in this. This is a generic one. So I can do the reason first. I can say angles in a quadrilateral, a quad lateral add to 360 degrees okay so again what I did there is I identified the shape I identified if it's a special shape it's not so I need to use the general rule which is the angles so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add up 120 120 and 80 which gives me so 120 plus 80 is 200 plus 120 is 320 and because they have to add up to 360, I'm just going to do 360 minus 320, which means that angle there should equal 40 degrees. Okay, and again, that's because angles in a quadrilateral add up to 360. The part B for the same question says the diagram below shows a triangle. The diagram is wrong, explain why. So here's my approach to this, because again, this could be kind of confusing, is we need to think about what a triangle is. Well, okay, first it's a three-sided shape. There are three sides, so that's correct. So that can't be the problem. The next, we could try and com compare the, the lengths, but they don't give us any lengths. Can't do it. The third fact about triangles is that the angles, so in fact, I'm probably gonna write this in my answer, angles in a triangle add to 180. So it's a good step to check if they do add up to 180. And again, remember, this is a calculator exam, but you're explaining, which means you need to write your working out, okay? Because that's what explain means, right? I can't just say, oh, they add up to more than 180. You don't believe me. I have to show you by adding them up, okay? So 80 plus 50 plus 60 gives me 190 degrees. So then I'd write, these angles add up to 190 degrees. There you go, perfect reasoning. Angles on a triangle add up to 180, these add up to 190. That's why it's wrong. That's all you have to write, okay? So, uh, lowest common multiple is normally done pretty poorly, especially because it's confused with the highest common factor. So. Honestly, with this, it is just a process that you need to know. Um, I will try and explain it to see if it makes more sense, but these are two processes, the highest common factor and lowest common multiple, that you should know. I would just encourage you to try a bunch of different ones. I will leave a link in the description to a highest common factor and lowest common multiple calculator. That way, if you run out of questions, in air quotes, just pick two numbers, work out the highest common factor, work out the lowest common multiple, you can put it into the calculator to check your answer. Okay, so there's an infinite number of questions that you can do. But here's the process. The first thing you wanna do is you want to do tree diagrams for both of these numbers. So 24, I like to just keep dividing by two, personally, and then you circle the numbers that can't be divided any further. They're prime numbers, okay? And then I'll just do two again, and six. Again, circling it. Then two again, three, there you go, we have two two, two, and three. Um, the next one you want to do is 56. We do the same thing, two and 28, circle that, two and 14. Again, if my number ends in a zero, two, four, six, or eight, it's an even number, so I keep dividing by two. And I think dividing by two is pretty easy, just personally, so I like to do that. Now, this step, not everyone does, and I am completely fine with that. But what I like to then do is write out the numbers. So two times two times two, that's two cubed, 
Or if you'd like, we can leave it as 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. And then 56 equals 2 times 2 times 2 times 7. So if we're looking for the lowest common multiple, what we want to do first is, first things first, all of these 2's are in common. So I'm going to write down 2 times 2 times 2. Okay, because those are in common. So the first thing you do is you write down all of the numbers that are in common, hence the term common. Now the next thing you do is you write down any numbers that are left out. Okay, so just to go over that again, you write the stuff that's in common. This would give me the highest common factor, okay, which would be 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. So if this question was HCF, the answer would be 8, because you just times the common numbers together. But with lowest common multiple, and this is the tricky bit, you have to also times whatever numbers are left over. So times 3 times 7. Again, if you want to check your answer, the answer can't be 8 because multiple means it's in the 24 and 56 times table. 8 definitely isn't. Okay. Get out your calculator. We have 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 7, which gives me 168. There's your two marks. Now, could you instead just write out the 24 and the 56 times tables, right? And they do 48 and then 112 and, and keep going on until you get to 168. The answer is yes, but you get no method marks. So if you get the answer right, you get a full two marks. If you don't get the answer right, you only get zero marks. Whereas with this, because you have an actual method, if you just get these kind of tree diagrams down, you actually get a mark just for doing that, which is a lot nicer. So just keep that in mind. Okay, for this question, uh, I'm going to confess the ruler that I have, it's not going to be accurate. So just to let you read the questions, the accurately drawn map, and that's the key thing, accurately, which means you can use measuring devices, so compasses, um, rulers, protractors, things like that, of three points A, B, and C. And it says Parveen walks in a straight line from A to B, she then walks from B to C, whereas Susan walks in a straight line from A to C. Parveen walks more meters than Susan, how many more? What you're supposed to do is you use the scale, one centimeter represents 150 meters. And here's what you do. I would probably work out Parveen first. So first of all, she went from A to B. Now, how would you work that out? What you do is you get your calculator, uh, your ruler even, and you would measure the distance from A to B. And that will be in centimeters. Again, my ruler is not going to be accurate, so we're not going to do it because I've zoomed in on my screen. I'd have to zoom out and make it perfect with the aspect ratio. It's a bit complicated. You'd measure that distance. Now, I'm going to use the mark scheme to tell you what that distance is. You should get an answer of 4.4 centimeters. Okay. Now, of course, that's not the actual distance from A to B because one centimeter is 150 meters. So we have to times that by 150 in order to get the actual distance she walks. Because remember, she's not walking along here, she's walking in real life. This is a scaled down diagram. So then you do 4.4 times 150, which should be 660 meters, perfect. And you repeat the same thing for B to C. Okay, so again, you'd get your ruler, you'd measure it properly. That's why I'd recommend printing this out, by the way. If you print out this paper, the link will be in the description. You can actually do this accurately. You need to know how to do it. So, my again, my ruler is not the best at doing this. Something like that. Measure that distance. You should get an answer of three and a half centimeters. But again, we need to times by 150, which would give me 525, I wanna say. 525 meters. So in total, Parveen walked, well, you just add those two together. So I would then write total. By the way, one of the biggest things in the examiner's reports is that examiners are saying they can't read or understand people's working. This makes it really clear if you lay it out like this. The clearer it is, the more likely the examiner can give you marks, which is, of course, a good thing. So make sure you lay your work out nice and neatly. Don't just start scribbling everywhere. That gives me 1,185 meters if we add it together. Now we're going to work out Susan. All of that, by the way, is giving me that first mark. 
Susan, uh, she just walks A to C. So again, you get your ruler, you measure out A to C. I went a bit too far. A to C. So put your ruler like that. But of course, this line would be zero. Measure that and you should get an answer of 6.2 centimeters. Um, but again, we need to times by 150. So go 6.2 times 150. 930 meters. That's your second mark. And it says, how much further does Parveen walk? So, 1185 minus 930 would be our answer. So, 1185, 5, there we go, minus 930 gives me an answer of 255 meters. your third mark just like that um okay bearings gonna be a bit tricky but i'm gonna show you I'm, I'm going to describe it again the only tricky bit would be then using the calculator what i would do is i'll draw a straight line going from a to c which i can do on this and keep in mind what it says it says find by measurement the bearing of a from c really important. So we're not working out this angle. That would be the bearing of C from A. Instead, we're actually working out that angle. Okay. So let me go through this one more time with the bearing. There's two things you need to remember. Okay. The one is it is always clockwise from north. So I'm trying to go from C to A but I need to go clockwise from north. I can't just go, oh, it's oh, this direction here. It has to be around from north. If you're unsure of the reason why, I do have a bearings video out on the channel, um, just to explain it a bit more. But the second thing is it has to be a three digit number, which isn't actually going to affect us in this case. Now, measuring that is a bit tricky. It depends on what protractor you have. You can measure that. But in my opinion, I would measure this angle and then do 360 minus whatever that green angle is, okay? And that should give you your answer. So whatever way you do it, whether you measure this angle here, which you would need the 360 protractor to do really, or you measure this angle, do 360 minus it, you should get an answer of 288, which is already a three digit number. So you don't need to do anything uh, special about that. You can leave it just as is. There we go. Okay, there are again videos on the channel, but also plenty of videos online showing you how to use protractors if you do need a bit of help on that. Contrary to popular belief, there are vectors in a uh, foundation paper. So they give us column vectors. Column vectors are pretty nice. They're not the end of the world, but you might not have seen them really before, or they might seem a bit confusing. So let me show you. If you're working out A plus B, all you do is you write the two vectors, okay? So two, three, with the vector between them. So what's the most common mistake here? The most common mistake is people treat them like fractions. They are not fractions. All you have to do is you add the top number and you add the bottom number. So two plus minus one, that's two minus one, which is one. Three plus two is five. Okay, you don't need to make a denominator the same because there is no denominator here, okay? There's no denominator at all. There's no numerator because they're not fractions. They're just two separate digits, okay? What about when we have 2a minus c? Well, we do the same thing, except I'm going to put the 2 in front of a, and then it's subtract c. Now, I like to make my life as easy as humanly possible, so I take really small steps, and I'd recommend you do the same. So the first thing I want to do, if I just move this up here, is I want to do the two times this. Well, how do you times a, a vector? That seems complicated. No, instead, all you do is you times the top and bottom number by the number outside. So two times two is four. Two times three is six. Then how do we do subtracting these? Well, it's the same as adding them, except of course we're subtracting the top and bottom. So four minus four is zero. You do need to write zeros, okay? Six minus one is five. 
Again, they're not fractions, so you wouldn't just write an answer of just zero. It's zero and five. That's all you do. Okay, not too bad. I would recommend practicing this every now and then, just so you remember. Maybe do one question a week where you just take two vectors and try and add them, and then take two vectors and times one, right? Just so you can kind of get used to it, so you remember it. Now, vectors are just illustrations of lines like this. So vector D is drawn on the grid. And as we can see, it goes down and to the right. And it says, from point P, draw the vector 2D. So the first thing we need to do is work out what the vector D is before we can work out 2D. So this is nice and easy. The top number is just how many right or left you're going. If it's positive, you're going to the right. So how many to the right does this go? Well, it goes one, two, three spaces to the right. Put a three there. The bottom number tells you how many up and down you're going. Up is positive, down is negative. So in this case, it's going down. So I'm just going to put the minus there straight away. And it's going down one, two. So that vector is three minus two. That's it. You wouldn't say three over minus two, by the way. That's a little... I mean, to be fair, no one... You never really have to say it in an exam, so don't worry. So 2D, well, what did I say we do with 2D? Well, we do 2 times all of these things, right? So, technically I didn't actually write the time sign, so let's leave that. So 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times minus 2 is minus 4. So, from point P, we are going 6 spaces to the right. So 6 to the right and four down. So starting from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, then four down, one, two, three, four. We should end up right here. So what I'm gonna do now is draw a straight line and it's gonna auto correct for me because I have a computer. You're gonna draw an arrow on here and write 2D like that. That's it. It is only one mark, which seems a bit harsh, I know, because there's a few steps we did. This way is very detailed and you won't make a mistake. Whereas some people just like to try and measure it and then do that. Up to you, okay? But that's how you do a vector question. Carly cycles to her friend's house. She stays at her friend's house for a number of minutes. She then cycles home. Here is the travel graph for a journey. So as you can see, it's a distance time graph. So here we can see she's traveling because she's changing her distance with time. Here she speeds up because the gradient is bigger. And here, because her distance isn't changing, it means she's stopped. And here she's returning back home. So it says, for how many minutes did Carly stay at her friend's house? Well, she's staying at her friend's house. That means she isn't moving. So we're looking at this section of the graph over here. And all we're going to do is read off the time. So here I can fairly easily see it's 8. 30. But this one on the end is a bit harder to read because it's not as exact as before. So what I want to do is work out what time she left. So if I scroll in nice and far, between 8.40 and 8.50 there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 minutes and there's 10 spaces. So each space is one minute. So she leaves at 8, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. She leaves at 8, 45. So the difference between 8, 30 and 8, 45 is 15 minutes. B, how far is Carly from her home at 8, 50? So at 8, 50, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line going up. Again, I'm gonna zoom back in just to make it a bit clearer. We're going to draw a line going up and the second we touch the graph, we're going to draw a line going horizontally. So I know which line this is. I would probably use a ruler in an exam potentially, although it's not necessarily required. Okay, so it's between four and five, and how many, num how many spaces are between four and five? Well, there are one, two, three, four, five spaces. So that means it goes up in 0 0.2s, right? The way I work that out is all you do is you take the difference in the values and you divide it by the number of spaces and that gives you a fifth so it goes up in 0 0.2 so that's 4.2, 4.4, 4.6 um, kilometers away from her house. And lastly 
Work out Carly's speed in kilometers per hour for the first 20 minutes of her journey. Okay, so first 20 minutes of her journey, that is going to be from 8 o'clock to 8.20, of course. So that is this initial bit. And how do you get speed from a distance time graph? You're working out the gradient. So here, and it goes over to here. So what we want to do is basically find the difference in the y values. So it goes from 0 to 4. So 4 minus 0. And then divided by the amount of time. Now, it's not 20 minutes because look at the units, kilometers per hour. So if I divide by 20, that's going to be kilometers per minute. Now, you can convert that, but that can be a bit tricky. So all I want to do is convert minutes into hours. All you do is you take the 20 minutes and you divide by how many minutes are in an hour? 60, which if you put on your calculator will give you a third. So we're going to do 4 minus 0 divided by a third. That's fine, we can do this on our calculators as I said before. 4 minus 0 over, do another fraction, 1 third, gives me 12 kilometers per hour. Decently fast, but I think she's cycling, yeah, so yeah, that's alright. This is going to be another one that's a bit tricky for me to uh, do on the computer, but we'll give it a go. So on the centimeter grid, draw an isosceles triangle with an area of 12 centimeters squared. So I would ignore the word isosceles just for one second. It has an area of 12 centimeters squared. How do you work out the area of a triangle? What you do is you do the base times height divided by 2 equals 12. So the base times the height has to equal 24, right? Because it's going to be twice as big as 12. So we've divided this by 2 to get 12, which means if we times by 2, it should um, t multiply to give 24. Now, here's where you get a lot of freedom. Because the base and the height are just any pair of numbers that times to 24. Now, would I pick like 24 and 1? Well, no, because 24 won't fit on this. So I'd probably pick, I mean, the first one that came to my mind was 8 and 3. So all you want to do is make your base 8 blocks wide. So if I say I start over here, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 might be a good way to do it. And then you would draw this with a ruler. Um, I've got autocorrect, so that's easy. And the height would be 3. Now the question is, where are you going to take your height from? Well, this is where the isosceles bit matters. With an isosceles triangle, two, the two, these two sides that are going to appear here have to be the same length. Now that's really tricky to do if you're going to try and draw the lines first. So one mistake that I see students make is they, they'll draw one line, draw the other, see if they're the same. If not, they'll try and redraw it and redraw it and redraw it and redraw it. Here's what you need to do. And this is an important side effect for the isosceles triangle. So because the t these two sides are going to be the same length, the height or the middle point is going to be directly in the middle of the base. So this whole thing is eight blocks wide. So midway through would be one, two, three, four blocks. So if I put a little mark there, and I've forgotten what it is already, one, two, three, four. My height is going to be, di or my middle point is going to be directly above this point. So now we're going to go three blocks up. One, two, three, mark that point. Now if I draw a straight line from these two points, and you can try this on a piece of paper yourself, those two lines are now going to be the same length, guaranteed. If you want, you can get rid of your marks, but I would keep them just to show the examiner that you did put thought into it. Some other numbers that would make sense would be kind of six and four, so making it six block wide and four blocks tall. But again, these two lines are the same length, that's the really key thing. The other thing I see people try and do is they try and count out 12 blocks and then do it that way, that, that's, just doesn't, that's not gonna work at all, okay? I hope that makes sense, both an isosceles triangle, the middle point, this the point that's going to be up, is always in the middle of the base. So mark the middle first. So for question 8, we have essentially just a bunch of rounding. So write 2530 to two significant figures. So it's really important to remember what a significant figure is, and this question itself really illustrates that quite nicely. So two significant figures, all you do is you count 1, 2. 
So we're rounding to that five. The number next to it, you check if it's five or bigger. In this case, it's not, right? It's smaller than five. So it means we leave it the same. So we're just going to write two, five, zero, zero. We just replace the other digits with the zeros. Now here, the next bit is something that I've seen even A-level students sometimes make a mistake on. So here it says to one significant figure, so some people might just write zero. Here's where things get a bit complicated. You start counting from the first non-zero number. So I'm actually counting from here and I go one <laughs> because it's the first digit. Really keep that in mind. Another common mistake is when there's like a zero in between. So if this was eight, zero, seven, four, you still count the zero in between, okay? So we're rounding to that eight. The number next to it, is it five or bigger? The answer is yes. So what we do is we add one to that number. And we don't need to write the other digits, but if you did write zero, zero, you wouldn't be wrong. But you don't have to write it, so let's just not write it. Question nine, this actually happens to be something that a lot of students do quite like, which is probability trees. So they're going to do a sports quiz and a music quiz. The probability that family wins the sports quiz is 0.3, uh, music quiz is 0.35. Complete the diagram. So here we have win and do not win. Now the key thing here is across these branches, we should add up to one. So we can use a calculator for this. So for example, in the first one, the probability that they do not win is just one minus the probability at the top 0 0.3, so 0 0.7, okay? Not too bad. And it'd be the same situation up here. So you do one minus 0 0.35, 0 0.65. And again, when I say the branches, I do mean like the actual pairs of branches. It's not all four of them, for example. But as you can see, it's actually going to be the exact same probability here. In this type of question, the marking is quite interesting because you don't gain marks, you lose them. So you start with two marks. Every mistake you make, so every value that's incorrect, you drop a mark. So you essentially have well, one chance to get a mark, right? If you don't get the first well, one of them right, then you still get one mark. If you don't get another one, you get zero. Then here it says, work out the probability that the Keddy family will win both the sports and the music quiz. So as you can see, we're looking at win, win, okay? And the probabilities associated with that are 0 0.3 and 0 0.35. Now the question is, what do you do with them? Well, when it's across branches, we add, right? So these two add to one, these two add to one, these two add to one. But when it's along branches, we multiply. So 0 0.3 multiplied by 0 0.35. So I'll use the calculator for this uh, just to make sure. And we get 0 0.105. And that gives us another two marks, which is pretty nice. For standard form, this is another slightly weak topic, so I would recommend going over it a couple of times just so you are very aware of it and you're very comfortable because it does it's based it's guaranteed to come up every year. At least one question on it. In this case, that's three marks, but it could be slightly more than that. So writing this as an ordinary number. Well, when it's minus, what I like to do is write the same number out, but put a bunch of zeros before the six. So I'm going to put a few zeros, six, seven, six point seven five. Okay. If this was a positive number, I would put these zeros after the last number. Okay. And now all we need to do is move this decimal point four, because the number here is four, places to the left. So one, two, three, four. So we're looking at zero point, I don't need this first zero. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of it. That was just an extra one. Zero, 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 six, seven, five. Now here's another good way to check, and this is like another way to work it out as well, is can you see this is minus four, right? So it's minus because the number gets smaller. So look at the four. How many zeros do we have before the six? We have four zeros. So if this was to the minus six, we should have six zeros before the six. If it's to the minus 10, we would have 10 zeros before the six. If it's to the minus one, we would have one zero before the six. So that's another way you can check. For this next one, this looks scary. Just shove the whole thing in your calculator, but it's probably not gonna give us standard form because we need to give our answer in standard form. So let's just first put it in. Now, I always recommend using brackets around each standard form number. So instead of doing that, I'll write like this. 
That's just to really make sure that bid mass is being done properly because B brackets are always done first. So the first number is 2.56 multiplied by 10 to the power of 6. So I want to work out that number, then I want to do this. Again, it, it won't always make a difference, but when it does make a difference, you don't want to be caught with your pants down, so to speak. So I always like to put them in brackets just to make sure. And again, I do this even when I'm doing kind of A-level physics, A-level maths, doesn't matter. Because I've seen it bite people in the butt. So do that. And as expected, we do not get a standard form answer. Five, nine, two, zero, zero. Now, if you know how to use your calculator, you might be able to get this in standard form using the engineering mode. But that normally does it in 10 to the powers of three. So you still need to know how to do this. At the moment, my decimal point is at the end. Yeah. Here's what you do. You find the first number that isn't zero, so six. Then you put a decimal point and you write every other digit. Now you ask yourself, do we actually need to write the zeros? The answer is no, because we don't normally write zeros after the decimal point. Cool. That's your first bit done. That's one mark because we got the decimal correct. So again, first non-zero digit, you put a dot, then you write every other digit. If there's zeros, you, if there's zeros at the end, you can skip them. If there's a zero in the middle, so this was 902, we would have to put the zero there, okay? So just keep that in mind. Then we do times 10, and all we do is we compare these two numbers. So if my decimal point is now here, how many times would I have to times by 10 in order to move it all the way over here? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that means our answer would be 10 to the power of 5. I do that even now in A-level maths and physics sometimes. And that's with my experience, which is about 10 years of teaching and doing this. So <laughs> I would recommend doing it like that. Again, you're only gonna have probably one question across the three papers. You get two minutes to do it. So do the, the steps as you would normally, okay? You don't need to be embarrassed because the only people that are gonna see it is an examiner and they don't know who you are. So don't worry if it seems babyish or something, just do it, it's completely fine. There are three different types of potato in a box. The table gives the number of each type of potato. How exciting, right? Jersey Royal, Charlotte, and a Maris Pe Piper. Pepper. Salim draws this pie chart for the information in the table. Write down two different things that are wrong or misleading. So I don't know if I've said this in a foundation video before, but I say this a lot. The best way to do the spot two mistakes questions is to do the question yourself. Okay? And the first thing I will say is here's what you want to check. Before you do anything, you check the labels. So if it's a graph, check that the labels are correct. In this case, it's a pie chart. So what do we need on a pie chart? Well, can you tell which potato is which? No. So the first thing is missing labels. One mark already. So the first thing you check, whether it's a graph, a pie chart, bar chart, whatever on earth it is, a pictogram, tally chart, check the labels. There should always be labels on any kind of diagram. Otherwise, I don't know what this is. Which one's Jersey Royal? I don't know. Which one's Charlotte? I don't know. The se second step is to actually do the steps yourself because I can't spot anything else wrong. So the second step is to actually do it yourself. How do you draw a pie chart? So keep in mind, in the exam, there's going to be a pie chart question, whether you draw it, whether you interpret it, whether you spot two things wrong because they need to know you know how to do it. So. How do you work out the size of each group? All you do is you add all of these up. So 105 at 105 is 210, add 90 is 300. That's the total number of potatoes, if I'm not mistaken, which I'm not. Then what you do is these 300 potatoes, you work out how much each one degree is worth, right? So one potato is worth 360 over 300 degrees. Because remember, in a circle, in a pie, there's 360 degrees, we have 300 potatoes, so each potato is going to get, that should be 1.2, if I'm not mistaken, 1.2 degrees. So now we can work out which angle, or what kind of angle each of these should get. So what I'm going to do is you do, well, one potato is 1.2, so 90 would be 90 times 1.2. Um, I'm not going to bother doing that on a calculator, let's just do it. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to bother doing it in my head. 
So it's 108 should be the first one. Okay. Next one should be, uh, so 105 times 102, but well, the next two should be 126. Now, that might be difficult to see here, but you can measure these angles. This to me looks like a right angle, and in fact it is. What he's done is he's actually said the number of potatoes equals the angle. So 90 degrees, 105, 105, which is not correct. So you could say that the angles are wrong. Angles are wrong, should be 108, uh, 126, and 126. Now, again, if you want to check if I'm right, best thing to do is get a protractor and measure these angles. They will be wrong, guaranteed. So again, just for the process of any write down two things they've done wrong, check the labels. If it's not a question that has labels, so maybe it's like uh, they're expanding brackets, what did they do wrong? Do the working out yourself and spot differences. This is psychological. If I tell you there's two steps wrong in here, what you're going to do is read it and there's going to be confirmation bias. Your brain auto-corrects for you. So it will skip mistakes. Have you ever seen those things on Instagram or whatever where certain words are repeated twice, but when you read it, you don't actually notice? So if there's two ofs here, you'd read number of potatoes, you wouldn't see the other of. Your brain auto-corrects. However, Human beings are really stubborn. If we do something and we spot something and we read something that contradicts what we did, we spot it immediately. That's why if you do the working out yourself, then you read someone else's working out, you will instantly spot any mistakes, any differences, which will be the mistakes. Okay? And that's because human beings are very stubborn. We're really good at pointing out contradictions. So that is the best way to do it and it's the fastest way. It's the most reliable way. Just staring at it for a long time. You might get it, you might not. The table gives information about the lengths of some pieces of string. How exciting. And Amos draws a frequency polygon for the information in the table. And write down two mistakes. So we've got another question which is uh, pointing out mistakes. So what did I say? Check the labels first. Then we're going to work out, we're going to actually pretend to plot this. So... First of all, they're both labeled, that's good, but let's see if they go up consistently. Well, this goes up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, so every two squares is 10. Good. 10, 20, 30, 50, 60. That's a mistake. So 40 missing on the frequency scale. 40 missing on frequency scale. Remember, each square should be worth the same amount. So we can't have this going up as two squares is 10, two squares is 10, two squares is 10, two squares is 20. That's illegal, okay? We cannot do that. So we've checked that and that's perfect. Now, what was the next step I said? I said you would actually do it for yourself. So in this case, we want to actually pretend to plot this frequency polygon. Now, how do you plot a frequency polygon? Well, what you do is you take the midpoint of each of these. So five, 15, 25, 35 and 45 and you plot the frequency so these are your coordinates basically okay and for the rest of them too so 5 15 should be the first point so 5 midway between 0 and 10 15 cool 15 20 uh midway between done 25 50 25 50 yeah 35 25 is correct and then 45 and 5 oh my he hasn't plotted the correct coordinate. So how would you write this? Well, I would say last point should be at 45 and five. Or you can say 45 instead of 50 and that would also be completely fine. But as you can see, it's a foolproof method, right? Because as I'm doing it, I can spot a contradiction really quickly. If you just read it and you kind of are aware, it's gonna be hard to spot that. So really be careful with that. Now this might be a bit tricky to do online as well, but I'm going to explain this to you. Rotating shapes, 90 degrees anti-clockwise. The best way to do this, absolute best way to do this is to get tracing paper. You are entitled to get tracing paper in your GCSE. And what you want to do is you get your tracing paper and you put it down in the middle of the page. So it says about zero, zero. So what you want to do is make sure your tracing paper goes over zero, zero and over the shape. 
Okay, so you want a big piece, not a tiny little square. Just so you're aware. You then trace the shape, like so. And what you're going to do is you're going to grab the shape, the actual paper, put your finger on top of the zero, zero, and you're going to rotate it 90 degrees. So that would be like so. Okay. Now, here's where it's difficult for me to do it on the computer is as you rotate that 90 degrees, the actual paper is going to move round and it's going to move like that. Okay. So it's going to move. So it's somewhat like this. I would recommend printing this out, getting some tracing paper, or if you have like really thin, bad paper, that would work as well. Trace it, finger, rotate it. I mean, it makes sense it would look like this because that's just rotated 90 degrees anti-clockwise. But when you rotate it, obviously it's not going to stay in place. It's going to move around as well. It's very, very, very hard to do this with your imagination. So practice with tracing paper because this is a free two marks. You would get a mark for the shape, another mark for the position. So if you just drew this over here somewhere, you'd get one out of two. If you, actually, maybe not that, but yeah, you get one out of two, and then you get the second mark for actually having it in the correct place. So again, print this page out, or the whole paper, depending on whatever, and practice with that tracing paper, okay? It's pretty much the only way to do rotation properly. Some students try doing it in their heads. Very few can reliably do it in their heads. Rick, Summer and Tommy are Tommy? Tony are playing a game with counters. Rick has some counters, Summer has twice as many, Tony has six less than Summer. Until they're 54. And then we have to get a ratio. Now that ratio bit probably scares people and a few people try and start from the ratio. Not my cup of tea. I'm gonna start from this information up here. So Rick has some counters. Do we know how many? No. Then I'm going to say he has N counters. Selma has twice as many, so she should have two n counters, two times the amount of Rick has. In as Tony has six less than Selma, so Selma has two n, Tony has six less, so he has two n minus six counters. In total, they have fifty-four. So if I add this up, it should give me fifty-four. One of the big things that I see uh, not a lot of students doing is writing out the information in a way that makes sense to them. So some students will look at this and say, I don't know what the first step is. And I'll say, neither do I, right? I can't, I don't know what the answer is straight away, right? I don't look at this and say, oh, the answer is one to five. And then I tell you how to get it. I work out the answer at the same time you do by using the information. So really just like look at each step and write each step out in terms of maths. That should add up to 54 because it's telling me in total. So if I add these up, it gives me 54. Okay. Let's simplify this. N plus 2N is 3N plus 2N again is 5N. Take away 6 equals 54. So now we're just rearranging for N. So what's stopping N from being by itself? Well, it's the 5 and the minus 6. I'm just going to put it out there. It's best to get rid of the thing that's not attached first. So let's add 6 to both sides. We get 5n minus 6 plus 6 is 0, so I don't need to write it. 54 plus 6 is 60. So 5 times n is 60. So n is going to be 60 divided by 5. It's a calculator exam, but... I don't, I don't know, calculator. Cool. That's already given me some marks in this 5 mark question. But now it says the total number of counters Rick has, the total that Tony has is 1 to P. So what I want to do is find out how many Rick and Tony have. So Rick has N counters. So Rick has 12 counters. Tony has 2N take away 6. So 2 times 12 is 24. Take away 6 is 18. Tony has 18 counters. So that means Rick to Tony is 12 to 18. And we want it so that the Rick number is one. So how do I make 12 into one? I divide by 12. So let's divide both sides by 12. And here, just use your calculator. It should be 1.5 though. Let's see if I'm right. Three over two, which is 1.5. So P is 1.5. 
So, in terms of the steps, I would argue that once you get to here, it becomes a bit easy to get to N. Again, you might need to practice your algebraic rearranging, your algebra. Then, again, if you just read what it says, you can work out what you need to do. The most tricky part in any paper, foundation or higher, whatever, is understanding what you need. Okay? So a lot of students will know how to, for example, simplify a ratio or do this. The tricky bit is knowing that you need to do that in the first place. So reading really carefully and just labeling everything up with maths is the best way you can just get method marks. Even if you get P wrong, what if you get four out of five or three out of five? It's a lot better than zero. Okay, so focus on getting method marks. We're getting into the um, hard, very well, harder sections of the foundation paper now. This looks heinous. Even I rolled my eyes when I looked at this. So it says in this diagram, PQR is isosceles, and it tells you that the two lines are equal, um, are the same length. So to be honest, this first line, we don't need to read it because we can see it from the di diagram. It then says that they're parallel lines, A, P, R, and C, Q, D. Again, that's on the diagram. So if you'd like, if the words kind of get annoying for you, is you can actually like cross this out, right? B, P, Q is a straight line. Maybe that's useful, maybe not, but you could cross that out as well. Okay, because again, those first two bits are on the diagram. So why do they even need to say it? APB is 56. We need to work out the size of angle CQR. I would recommend labeling what CQR is. Well, that is that angle. Okie dokie. So what pops to my mind? Well, because we have these two parallel lines, I'm immediately thinking of F, C, and Z angles. Now, bear in mind, in your exam, you cannot call them F, C, and Z angles. You need to call them alternate angles co-interior angles and um, corresponding angles. You cannot use the words, <laughs> oh sorry, the letters F, C and Z, okay? That's just for our sake. So a few things, so what would I do? Well, in my opinion, I would just start working out angles and then seeing if that helps me out in some way. So first of all, the literally the first thing I saw was that this is a big X, right? And as you may be aware, if you make up an X with two straight lines, so like that, the opposite angles are equal. So in this case, the top and the bottom angle are the same and the left and right angle are the same. So in other words, this angle here is also 56. So what I'm going to write is QPR, which again, I think is a football team, is equal to 56 degrees because vertically opposite angles, vertically opposite angles are equal. Cool. Well, what does that lead me to? Well, in this isosceles triangle, the base angles, the bottom angles should be the same. Okay. So if I do 180 minus 56, which is 124, that's both of these angles added together. So if I divide that by two, that gives me angles P, Q, R, which is also equal to, to be fair, we don't need P, R, Q, so maybe I won't write that, but it would be the same as the angle P, R, Q, again, because these bottom angles here are the same. Why? Because base angles in isosceles triangle are the same. Cool. We're actually really close. Okay, so I now know that this part over here is equal to 62 degrees. So I'm noticing now, if I can work out this part of the angle then all of a sudden I can just add the red and blue parts to make the whole green part, right? Interesting. Well, I mentioned before, I'm thinking FCZ angles when I have two parallel lines. We haven't used that yet. 
So, but this red angle and this angle here are corresponding angles. Co-interior angles, sorry. So this red angle and this angle here are co-interior angles. So if I knew this angle, I could work out this one. Have a look at this. Uh, let's use a different color. Let's use black. This angle, the black angle on 56, should add up to 180 because that's a straight line. And what do angles on a straight line add up to? 180. So APQ, APQ equals 180 minus was it 56? Yeah, 56 <laughs> is 124 degrees because angles on straight line add to 180 degrees. And that means that the red angle is 180 minus 124 because co interior angles add up to 180. So CQP also equals 180 minus 124, which of course is 56. Because co interior angles add to 180. So now my green angle, my answer, uh, CQR, is just 56 plus. 60, 62? Yeah, 62. Okay, so that would be what, 118? Yeah, 118 degrees. You don't need a reason for the last bit because you're not working anything out, so to speak. You're just saying what the actual final answer is. But yeah, four pieces of working out with reasons are one mark each and you get a mark for the final answer. Pretty harsh, to be honest. There's a lot of writing in this question. But is what it is. You need to be able to do that. You need to come up with those reasons. But again, notice that I didn't know what to do until I started working angles out. So don't be afraid to just start working stuff out. That's completely fine. This is probably one of the hardest questions on the paper. Only a two marker, a humble two marker. The geometry tends to be a bit weak. It says on the grid draw quadrilaterals, so a four sided shape, with no lines of symmetry. So that means no squares or rectangles or diamond shapes, so rhombuses or anything like that. And a rotational symmetry of order two. So that means you can rotate it by two different angles and get the same shape. So maybe you rotate by 90 and 180 and they both give you the same shape. If you know your shapes really, really well, and I mean really well, you can come up with something. There is only one quadrilateral that has no lines of symmetry and rotational symmetry. That is a parallelogram. <laughs> There's no real way you can work that out except maybe trial and error, so drawing different four-sided shapes and then testing it out. So I would have left this question for last and used my spare time to do that if I didn't remember the whole parallel parallelogram thing because you don't want to keep guessing in an exam when you've got other questions to do, which you, you, you can work out. This is something you can't exactly work out, it's more trial and error. So yeah, the only shape that fulfills that criteria is a parallelogram. That is way too steep, one second. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna draw it super accurately. Oh, that's just not bad. That's actually not bad at all. So as you can see, there's no lines of symmetry, no matter which way you cut it. However, you can rotate it by 180 degrees and also um, flip it in order to get the rotational symmetry. Tricky. Really, really tricky. So, again, I would have left it till last if I didn't remember the parallelogram thing and probably just tried a little bit of trial and error, so drew it. I mean, I would have probably eliminated square, rectangle, and diamond straight away. So then that only leaves trapezium and parallelogram. When I drew my trapezium, I would have seen that there's a line of symmetry, so it can't be that. It must be parallelogram. But that takes time. So leave it for last if you're not sure. Here's a right angle triangle, of course. Work out the value of x. When you have right angle triangles, two things should pop into mind, trig and Pythagoras. Now the question is, which one do you use? Well, if there is an angle or you want to work out an angle, use trig. Uh, actually, I think a lot of people use x now for that. So if there's any kind of angle that you need to work out or you have, 
you use trig. If it's just sides, you use Pythagoras. In this case, we only have sides, right? We have the hypotenuse, we have the, um, well, one of the sides, we wanna work out the other side. As you may be aware, these two sides, if you add them together, so x squared plus four squared, should equal 8.5 squared. So just rearranging that, moving the four squared over to the other side, and then square rooting gives you your answer. Some students prefer to memorize a few different equations. So for example, if you're working out the hypotenuse, you add and square them, so like this. Some people, and then if you're working out one of the sides, you can just square and subtract them instead. Whichever way you wanna do it is up to you. I'm, I'm not too fussed. You know, whatever it takes to, to get the answer right is uh, my philosophy on that. And you get 15 over two, you get 7.5. Um, hopefully not too bad. Job done. This type of question is two marks and yet a lot of people get it wrong. So let me go through this. Again, algebra is really, really important with your GCSE maths, okay? No matter if you're doing foundation high, it doesn't matter, okay? We have this equation, t equals four m squared minus 11. Think about what's happening. It's four times m squared, okay? E minus 11. Well, what's m? it's minus three. So what I would do is I would do minus three squared. Now do not do this, Whoop, oh, hold on. do not do this, wrong. It's minus three all squared, nine. Then we're timesing it by four, because it's four times m squared. Then we're taking away 11, 25. There we go. Some of you may be okay with substituting, but if not, do that. Read it like a book. Four times m squared. Okay, m squared is nine. Four times nine is 36. Take away 11 is this. And do it in your calculator. However, for those of you good with uh, substituting, you are replacing m with minus three, but again, you need to put those brackets, okay? You need them. It's not four minus three squared minus 11, because that's a really dangerous thing to write. Because it looks like four take away three squared. Well, three squared is nine. So four take away nine is minus five. Take away 11 again is negative 16. So yeah, be careful. So either this or just doing it on your calculator. Muy bien, very good, okay? Part B, rearranging, tends to be pretty weak. So I'm just gonna write the, I'm writing the exact same equation out again. I haven't written anything differently. And when it says make P the subject, our answer should be P equals blah, 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 blah. A bunch of stuff, okay? So, this is all again. There's no set strategy to do that. Well, there is a strategy, but there's no set steps. It's not always going to be do this and then do this and then do this. It, you have to just apply it to the situation, okay? So, you want P by itself on the right-hand side. So you ask yourself, what is stopping p from being by itself on the right hand side well what else is with p well i have the number three and i have a plus four i need to get rid of both of them so which one do you get rid of first it doesn't matter but getting rid of the thing that isn't attached is it will make your life easier because if you divide by three you have to divide everything by three and now you've got a bunch of fractions everywhere which is nasty so I would take away four first. And we get, well, D minus four, I can't actually do it. So let's just write D minus four. The three P stays the same. And then I have plus four minus four is zero. Cool, I've gotten rid of the plus four. Now the three. What's the three doing to the P? It's multiplying. So I need to do the opposite. I need to divide. Now. I need to divide everything on the left-hand side by three. The best thing to do, I can't actually do D divided by three though, right? Like what number's that? I don't know. So here's what I, the way I would leave it. I would leave it as D minus four over three equals P. That's your final answer. But if you wrote D over four minus uh, four over three equals P, um, sorry, sorry, D over three, 
should be. That is also correct, but again, that's probably the, the nicer way to write it, okay? I hope that makes a bit of sense. Again, please practice your algebra, okay? It will come up. This is a funky question. Jessica runs for 15 minutes at a speed of six miles an hour, then 40 minutes at a speed of nine miles an hour. It takes Amy 45 minutes to run the same distance Jessica runs. Work out Amy's average speed. Give your answer in miles per hour. Okay, here's, here's my step to this. First thing first, I'm gonna write up the equation. Speed equals distance over time. So if I'm talking about just Amy for a second, because that's the end goal, right? Amy's average speed. The word average, you can kind of ignore in this case. You're just working out her speed, okay? With Amy, to work out speed, I need distance and time. Do I have distance? Well, if I'm reading the question, no. Do I have time? 45 mins. So, all I need is the distance Amy runs. So again, the way I'm laying this out is very, very particular, okay? Because I'm thinking about what I need. To work out speed, I need distance and time. I have time, but I don't have distance. But what does it tell me? It's the same distance Jessica runs. So now I'll write Jessica on the other side of the page. And I would work out how far she ran. So for some of you, you might prefer the formula triangle. Okay. So if I want distance, I need speed and time, right? So if I'm covering this up, speed and time. I have time, speed, time, speed. Now, the thing is, there are two different sets in this journey, set one and set two, because she changes speed. So for one, the distance is going to be speed times time. But the speed is fine, six miles an hour. But we need miles per hour, right? This is in minutes. So what is 15 minutes as hours? Well, all you need to do is how, ask yourself how many minutes are in an hour? There's 60. So you do 15 divided by 60. It's a quarter of an hour. So we're doing a six, uh, sorry, six times one quarter. That will be the distance she travels. So let's do that. Six times one quarter, 1.5 miles. And again, look how I'm laying this out. The examiner has to give me marks. I've made it very clear what I'm doing. The next one, again, the speed is fine. We have nine miles per hour. But again, they've given me the time in minutes. So once again, I need that in hours. So you do 40 minutes divided by the number of minutes in an hour, which is 60, two thirds. So you might want to leave it as two thirds, not as a decimal. And work out that. So again, we're going to do nine times two thirds, six miles. So then the total distance equals six plus 1.5, which is 7.5 miles, okay? Now, going back to Amy for a second, they run the same total distance. So that distance is her distance. So now I'm just going to write, and I like to put it in line with the other side, because if you're reading it like a book, if I suddenly write, you know, 7.5 miles up here, the examiner's gonna think, well, how the hell do you know that? So I like to write it down here. So now for Amy, speed is distance over time. So speed equals 7.5 distance. And what's the time? 45 minutes. But again, we need it in hours. So once again, you do 45 minutes divided by how many minutes are in an hour? 60. Gives you three quarters. Or 0 0.75, whatever you want to call it. 
and you just do that on your calculator. So 7.5 divided by 3 quarters gives me 10 miles per hour. And that is your final answer for marks. Look how it's laid out. Listen to how I thought through the problem. Again, I didn't know what the answer was until I did it. And just lay things out neatly so your examiner has an excuse to give you marks. Okay, best thing you can do. If they can look at the mark scheme and look here and go, uh, yeah, 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 yep, yeah, that's good. In this case, you do get marks working out distance, distance, total distance, and then the actual speed. So if they can just go through and check mark it, cool, good, perfect. Interesting, we have another algebra question. So again, it's come up quite a bit. So make A the subject of the formula, 3A minus nine. So we want A to be the subject. So I like to write this out one more time and I like to spread it out a little bit. It might be a good idea to pause the video and have a go if you're a bit unsure because we have just done one. But again, what we do is we ask ourselves, what's stopping the A from being by itself? Because remember, our answer is going to be A equals and then blah, 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 blah. Well, there's a 3 here and there's a negative 9. So we need to get rid of the 3 and the negative 9. I like to get rid of the thing that's not attached first, so the negative 9. I've said negative 9 so many times now, it's losing meaning. So I'm going to add 9 to both sides because the opposite of taking away 9 is adding 9. P plus 9 you can't actually do, so let's leave it as P plus 9. 3a stays the same. Minus 9 plus 9 is 0, so that's good. What's that 3 doing to the a? It's multiplying, so we need to divide. Uh, and I'm going to have to write it next to it. So p plus 9 over 3 equals a. If you wrote it as p over 3 plus 3, that is also correct, okay? So they do give you, you know, the marks for both of them. I like the way I wrote it just because it looks neater. That's literally the only reason. But they're both equally correct. This is probably the second hardest question. Now, again, in terms of when I say difficulty, I don't mean it's difficulty. I mean that most students won't know how to do this because it's very rarely spoken about. It's very rarely learnt. So if you remember before, it was the very specific details about parallelograms. This case, converting compound units, very unlikely. So this 30 meters per second, I'm going to do my best to show you this. It's 30 and then meters over seconds. And we're trying to change it into kilometers over hour. Okay. This is where things are going to get fun. And when I, by that I mean tricky. I like to think this through very logically. Now, let's take it step by step. So I'm going to actually make this kilometers per second first. And all right. Now, if I travel 30 meters in a second, okay, actually no, first, how do I go from meters to kilometers? You divide by a thousand. So you're gonna divide this by a thousand. That makes sense, right? If I travel 30 meters in a second, I'm not gonna travel 30 times a thousand kilometers in a second. I'm going to travel divide by a thousand. It should be a smaller number because a kilometer is bigger than a meter. The time it takes for me to travel a meter should be smaller than the time it takes for me to travel a kilometer, which is a thousand meters. So I would divide by a thousand first. And this is, by the way, where I'm going to use the answer key on my calculator 30 divided by a thousand. We get 0 0.03. Right? Okay, now to jump to kilometers per hour is where it gets interesting because how do you go from seconds to hours? Well, once again, you're going to divide by 60 to get minutes and 60 again 
to get hours. So you might be tempted to do divide 60. No. And this is where you need to think logically. Although I am dividing by 60 twice to go from seconds to hours, think about it. Imagine I'm running, okay? And I run for 10 seconds. I travel a distance. And then I run for 10 hours. My distance traveled should be bigger in 10 hours than 10 seconds, right? Or let's say you're driving. If you go on a 30 minute drive or 30 second drive compared to a three hour drive, you've traveled more distance because you've been driving for longer. So my number should go up. That's the confusing bit. Even though it says divide by 60, I'm actually going to times by 60. Because let's say I do te 10 meters every second. In an hour, or let's say in a minute, I would do 10 times 60 seconds, so it gets bigger. And in an hour, I times by 60 again. So you need to times by 60 twice. I hope that makes sense. But that should be 108 kilometers per hour. So the first one where we went from meters to kilometers, we made the number smaller because the number of meters should be smaller than the number of kilometers. But in the next one, we went bigger because the amount of time we're traveling has gone up. It's gone from a second to an hour. I should travel way further in an hour than in a second. Percentages, fairly tricky. The value of Michelle's car has decreased by 15%. The car now, now had, now, has a value of 13,600. That is the most important word in this whole thing. Now has a value. Because this is actually reverse percentages. So the, the number's already changed. We need to find the original number. So here's how I do it. If it's decreased by 15%, that means we've taken the 100%, which is the original value, and we've subtracted 15%, so it's at 85% of its original value. So 85% equals 13,600. So all we want to do is get back up to 100%. Um, there are so many ways to do this. I'm not going to tell you a correct way, but the, the way I find helps the most for people is we always go down to 1%. And we work out what that is. So how do I go from 85 to 1? I divide by 85. Whatever I do to the left, I have to do to the right. So we're going to take that 13,600. And we're going to divide by 85. Which gives us 160, a nice round number. And then we always want to go back up to 100%. 100% is always your starting value. So how do I go from 1 to 100? Well, I obviously times by 100 do that, you're going to get 16,000 pounds. Just like that. That's the way I would do it because it, being very careful with my words, it always works. Write what the percentage is now. So if it's gone up, it's above 100%. If it's gone, if it's decreased, then it's below 100%. Go to one by dividing by whatever the percentage is and then times 100 always works, okay? But these numbers will change. It might not be 85, it could be 110, it could be 60, it could be whatever. Just keep that in mind. All of these conversions, man. <laughs> uh, conversions tend to be weak for higher and foundation students, especially when it's cubed and especially when it's compound measures. Um, again, that's why this is an aiming for grade five paper. Because if you know how to do the conversions, that means you know the spec very, very well, which means you'll be able to get very high grades in theory. So how do you go from a centimetre to a metre? Well, centimetre to metre, which write back in blue, you divide by 100. So the most common thing here is that people say divide by 100 and you get 80. Wrong. I'm going to point out again, I have A-level physics students that make this mistake. So keep that in mind. To go from centimetres to metres, you do divide by 100. That much is perfectly true. But are we dealing with centimetres and metres? We're dealing with centimetres cubed and metres cubed. 
So you don't divide by 100, you divide by 100 cubed. If this was centimetres squared to metres squared, you divide by 100 squared. That's all. That's it. That's the only trick they have. So, 8,000 divided by 100 cubed is my answer. 8 times 10 to the minus 3. If you want, you can write it in normal form. But, I mean, why bother? Why make your life harder? Now, kilometers per hour to meters per second. I mean, as you can see back here, we went from meters per second to kilometers per hour. So you could go backwards. So divide by 60 and 60 and then times by 1,000. But let's make this a bit more interesting. Again, have a go yourself. But I'm going to keep going through this straight away. <laughs> so 100 kilometers over hour. The first thing I want to do is change it to meters per hour. Now again, if I travel one kilometer in an hour, then how many meters do I travel in an hour? 1,000 meters in an hour. So to go from here to here, we need two times by 1,000. So 180 times 1,000 gives me 180,000 meters per hour. Does that make sense? So if I've traveled two kilometers in an hour, that means I've traveled 2,000 meters in an hour. Now here comes the fun bit. We need to go to meters per second. Let's use the same logic. If I'm walking and I manage to walk one kilometer, 1,000 meters in an hour, in a second, I'm going to travel way less than that. Think about it. If I put you outside your front door and I said, okay, walk for one second, you'll probably take one step. Now, if I say walk for an hour, you'll take way more steps. So all you need to do is, well, to go from hours to seconds, we times by 60, times by 60, but we know the number should get smaller. So what we're going to do is divide by 60 twice. So 180,000, divide by 60, divide by another 60, gives me 50. So 50 meters per second for three whole marks. Lovely. I hope that makes sense. Again, think it through logically. There are 30 men and 20 women in a uh, 30 women and 20 men in a gym. The mean height of all 50 people is 167.6. The mean height of the men is 182. Work out the mean height of the women. Well, to work out this mean, we would need the uh, total heights. So the height of all women, as in the total height. And we need to divide it by the number of women, 30. So the only thing we don't have is this. So how can we work this out? Well, from here we can work out the total height of everyone. And from here we can work out the total height of the men. Subtract those two and we're left with the total height of the women. And then we're done. So, how do you work out the total height of everyone? Well, if there's 50 people and on average they're 167.6 centimetres tall, you just need to times that. So if I say, let's make the numbers easier. If I say the average person is two meters tall, I know that's huge, and there's 30 people, then in total they are 30 times two, 60 meters tall. Do the same thing for the men. 20 times 182 equals, equals. Head on over to Mr. Calculator, our best friend. We have 50 times 167.6 gives me 8,380 centimeters. 20 times 182, 3640, which means the total height of the women, so um, height all women, I really do write like a caveman. All we do is we subtract those two numbers because if they're not women, sorry, if they're not men, they're going to be women in this case. 8380 minus 3640, Gives me 4,740 centimetres. So then all we do is sub it into our formula. This is only two marks, which is actually a bit harsh in my opinion. But, you know, what can we do? The exam board giveth and the exam board taketh. So the average woman is 158 centimetres 
at all. That is an incredible height difference between the men and the women. I mean, to be fair, this is like, what, six foot three? Six foot two? <laughs> fair play, I guess they're very tall. Uh, oh, it's three marks, never mind. That makes more sense. So, because I was going to say the mark distribution is one mark for working out these two, second mark for working out the height of the women, and the third mark for getting the answer, of course. So, perfect. Okie dokie. Karina has four tanks on her tractor. Each is a cylinder with a diameter of 80 and a height of 160. Four tanks are to be completely filled with a mixture of fertilizer and water, which is mixed in a ratio of 1 to 100. So there's 100 times more water than fertilizer. Karina has 32 litres of fertilizer. One litre is 1,000 cubic centimetres. Has she got enough? So quite clearly, we're going to need to work out the volume of this one tank and then times it by four because there's four tanks in total. So how do you work out the volume of a cylinder? Well, a cylinder is a type of prism. So all you want to do is work out the area. How do you work out the area of that shape? Well, it's a circle. You do pi r squared and you times it by its height. 160. So that means our volume here is pi, not 80, because that's the diameter. So you half it, 40 squared times 160. And let's see what that gives us. Forty squared multiplied by one hundred and sixty gives me a freaking huge number. Okay, um Mm, okay, so I'm not going to write out this full number, 7 dot dot dot, and we say it goes on forever because we have four of them. So the total volume of the tanks is equal to four times this. So I'm just going to take this number, we'll do answer times four gives me that number, which is, that's way easier to see. Okay, three, two, one, six, nine, nine, zero point eight, seven, seven centimeters cubed. Now with the fertilizer, we have, um, fertilizer, that is 32 liters, but it says that a liter is a thousand centimeters cubed. So that is 32,000 centimeters cubed. Now you might be tempted to say, whoops, that's squared. You might be tempted to say, well, but this number is way bigger than this number, therefore yes. But we need to mix uh, mix it in a, we need to mix it in a ratio. It's a mixture, right? So it's in a ratio of one to a hundred by volume. So there's a hundred times more water than fertilizer. So in total, can you see that's 101 parts that they're mixing this in? So the total volume we need to fit all of that fertilizer is 101 times 32,000, okay? So again, we have 32,000 cubic centimeters of fertilizer, but we need 10 times that in water. So we need, sorry, 100 times that in water. So three, that'd be 200, and then one, two, three, plus that as our total, okay? Because we need 10 times this in water alone, which is the same as 101 times this, by the way. So either way, these two numbers will be the same. So actually, let's do it this way. So the top way, three, two, zero, zero, one, two, three. It gives me that number. I'll write it out for you. Do not worry. And that is the same for both of these. So either way you want to work this out, it's the same thing. Now we're comparing this. Well, all you'd need to do is, if I look at this number, let's break it up quickly. That number is smaller than this number. Right, can you see that? If you're unsure, take this number, this number, and subtract it by this. It's bigger by a lot. So, two, three, two, zero, zero, zero is bigger than the volume of the tanks. Therefore, she has enough. That's all you have to do.
And for the final question of the paper, we have some ugly algebra and geometry put together in a big package of annoyance. So we have a rectangle, yeah, so this thing's a rectangle. The reason why they've told you that is it means the opposite sides are equal. So that means this is also 4x, and this whole thing here can also be called 3x plus 5. If you wanted to, and all measurements in centimeters, okay, wonderful. The area of this trapezium is A, and it says show that A is equal to this. So basically, we need to find an algebraic expression for this. Well, what shape is this? It's a trapezium. How do you work out a trapezium? You do A plus B divided by 2 or times by a half times H. A and B are the opposing sides. So A and B, it doesn't really matter which way around you do it, by the way. And H is, of course, 4x in this case. So we have a half. God, I can't speak. A was 5. Plus now, this is the hard one, working out B. The total length is 3x plus 5, right? Minus 2x. Because the 2x already taken, we're only looking for this bit. So that means that little piece over here is just x plus 5. Because 3x plus 5 minus 2x, 3x minus 2x is x. So x plus 5. And the height was 4x. So a half of 4x is 2x, so let's do that first. And the inside is x plus 10. 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times 10 is 20x. Job done. So, I mean, technically all of this is equal to a, but I find when you put the a first, it can get a bit confusing. So I'd have just left it like that. And that's it for the paper. Pretty tricky paper. There were some hard bits in there, definitely. But I hope you enjoyed. Again, the links to the other two papers are going to be in the description if you want to have a look at those. And of course, the link to the actual just blank paper will be in the description as well. Have a great day, and I hope this is useful.